The Beacon, celebrating when God uses the unexpected to do the unexplainable. Hey, well, good morning and welcome to The Beacon. My name is Steve Woods. I serve as your host. We're coming to you uh, via the radio on 960 The Patriot. We appreciate the station for allowing us to be aired every Sunday morning. In addition to that, uh, you are maybe listening to The Beacon through one of the many podcasts where you happen to get your info. And we're just delighted that you've tuned in today. You have tuned into an amazing episode. We are thrilled to have a very special guest. And of course, in addition to our guest, I have Jeff Blake, superintendent of Phoenix Christian Preparatory School, which uh, sponsors the program. Jeff, thanks for being here. Thank you, Steve. Good morning. I am really excited for this morning's program. Well, it's super cool. Every week we have an opportunity to welcome somebody and we get a chance to shine maybe a brighter light on things that that uh, God is doing. And we talk about the program being one where we celebrate ways in which God uses the unexpected to do the unexplainable. And it just so happens that you know, today's guest, in addition to fitting that description and, and being somebody who God is using in a really cool way, um, has a connection to Phoenix Christian. So, uh, Jeff, why don't I, I have you welcome our guest today? Well, you bet. We are proud of our alumni, and this morning is a, is a case in point. And my wife was, I think, walking through Facebook and noticed a posting of some pretty amazing um, investment in community uh, by Joseph Zanovich. And she says, you got to hear this, you got to see this. And she was compelled and we started talking about it, reflecting on it. And I thought, we have got to have an opportunity to introduce Joseph to our, to our listening audience and celebrate uh, when God uses some pretty amazing, unexpected things to do the unexplainable. And so Joseph, a proud alum of Phoenix Christian of the class of, I get, hope I'm getting it right, 1997, is that right? That's right. 1997. <laughs> Amen to that. And we're so blessed you're on the show this morning. And the Zanovich family has a legacy here at the school. And we are proud to celebrate what you're doing in your community, you as an individual, and to celebrate um, how God's using you. So welcome to the program this morning. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. <laughs> well, for the benefit of our listeners, Joseph, for about a year now, has been uh, has founded and is working through an organization called Homeless Outreach Providing Encouragement. Uh, and, uh, you know, the short version of that is hope, hope, <laughs> homeless outreach, providing encouragement. And I saw the same post that, that Jeff referred to, um, on Facebook and uh, a couple of articles that, uh, are highlighting the ways in which God is using the organization and Joseph, you know, give us just a, just a glimpse of, uh, how that came to be. And then we'll backtrack a little bit and talk a little bit about your personal story and kind of what led up to, uh, this current involvement. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one clarification, I did not found the organization. I okay. do uh, run the organization as the executive director. Um, well, thank proud, you. Yeah, proud to be a part of, of that. And uh, Hope Homeless Outreach, uh, really, and as you hear my story, you'll see how I, how I really uh, was brought into this uh, by divine connection um, to do this work, uh, especially in a city of 100,000 people, you know, 45 minutes north of Denver, who would have thought a guy from, you know, Phoenix, Arizona would be up here doing this. But Hope Homeless Outreach uh, is an organization. We run a sheltering program. We run a street outreach program. We have assistance. Uh, and now we do this program called Safe Law, which I founded, um, really designed for folks that have to sleep in their vehicles. Uh, and we're working on other programs to just really meet people where they are at and get them out as quickly as possible to a better space. That's awesome. And I, and I read specifically about safe lots and just the concept of taking something that's kind of been there. It's, it's right there in front of us and, uh, and being able to connect the dots between this incredible resource that's needed and a safe place for those that are, you know, in the unfortunate position of having to, to live out of their cars and, um, you know, as I, as I was reading about it, I mean, I, there were a couple of things that I, and I, and maybe I'm, uh, maybe this is not that unusual in the sense that, you know, you can have a heart for the homeless without being able to ever really comprehend or understand fully having not been homeless yourself, some of the complications that, that don't meet the eye that come with that. I mean, one that came to mind was just, uh, you know, somebody who's already in a difficult space, a difficult, you know, uh, season of their life. And uh, a shelter that's available says, yeah, you're totally welcome here, but your pet is going to have to go someplace else. And so now somebody who's already in a, in a really tough spot is faced with the decision of having to give up what might be their closest family member, right? 
You're exactly right. You know, one of the things about homelessness, and I could spend a lot of time on it, is just that, you know, homelessness is not a disease. You don't catch, you know, the COVID homelessness. Right. You know, this can happen to anyone, um, you yeah. know, and because, you know, many of us have been blessed who may be listening that have had a support system, right? That, you know, many times in our life, and I have had to ask myself this too, I mean, how many times have my parents have had to bail me out or you know, someone in my circle was there for me. Right. Um, and all too often, you know, homelessness will, will happen to someone because there's the support system that I take for granted isn't there for them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and something happens beyond their control. And so, yeah, absolutely. When, it, when I look at the best way to help, it's, it's ultimately housing is where we want people to be. We want people to be in a home. Right. Um, I don't want people to be in a car. I don't want people to sleep in a shelter. I don't, I don't want any of this. In fact, this whole system, I wish I didn't even have to do this work at all. Um, but that's not reality, right? And, right. We, and we, have, we have this where, you know, folks are falling through uh, the proverbial cracks as far as needing a place to stay, you know? And uh, for me, I look at this as a two-tiered system. I, I, I catch people as soon as I can. If they're fallen, um, from, a, from a stable environment, I want to catch them as soon as I can, get them resources, and get them to a place where they, they can be self-sufficient and back. I, the best news I ever get from someone is like, hey, I'm out of here. I've got a place to stay. And I'm like, yes. Yeah. Yes. Great. Yeah. <laughs> and that makes me yeah. so happy. Well, it, it's just, it's incredible. And it's amazing, uh, you know, that you have the opportunity that you do and the place that you do to do the things that God's doing through you and your availability. And that of the organization, but you know, rewind a little bit and, and talk about, like you said, how does a guy get from Phoenix to Colorado? Uh, we talked a little off air about a pit stop that was transformational in, in your life. Um, you know, give us a little a, a personal look into, uh, into, into you, you and your story and, uh, and your walk with the Lord at this point. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and Phoenix was great. I mean, this Phoenix is my home and, um, I've been in the nonprofit world now for over 16 years. I started out actually uh, running an event many listeners may know. It's the Scottsdale Culinary Festival. Oh, cool. uh, and I ran the Scottsdale League for the Arts, and I ran that organization for about seven years. And I felt called then to leave. I, I then met my now wife, uh, who was living in L.A., and I decided I needed a change. So I went out to, to L.A., uh, and we ended up starting what is what became a global nonprofit. Um, uh, it was actually for the dance industry. My, my wife is a professional dancer and we started an advocacy organization called Youth Protection Advocates in Dance and then later gymnastics. Um, all too often in the news, we hear about sex abuse cases. We mm. hear uh, about this. We, uh, starting in 2012, we're really working on that in the dance industry. So advocacy started becoming a part of my life and something I didn't really know much about at the time, but I knew that something had to be done. So this nonprofit was started in LA and we worked with the entertainment industry. We traveled, uh, really became, we traveled all over giving seminars, um, really helping uh, parents, teachers, uh, and children um, in this industry that really has exploited and objectified children. And there were so many issues there. So my white, my, I call it the, my white pad story is a story in itself and it still continues. Uh, and I was a consultant, but that was amazing to me. Um, and seeing, you know, to stand up for something is for, for vulnerable. When we talk about kids, some of the most vulnerable in our society that, you know, don't have choices, but they may be in situations um, that put them in the emotional harm's way. So we started that organization. Now, while I was in Los Angeles, uh, we had a, a program where we'd go down to Skid Row. Uh, for anyone that's been to Los Angeles and you've been to Skid Row, it, it, it doesn't make sense. I'll just, it, that's the best way I can put it. The first time I went down there, I was like, I'm looking at six city blocks of thousands of people living on the sidewalk, living on the street, and this doesn't make sense to me. How can we as a society let this happen? I was just dumbstruck for weeks after I went there the first time. And I decided, you know what, the best way I can learn why this is happening is just go down there and talk to people. Mm -hmm. So I, I went down and I volunteered at a place called the Midnight Mission. It's been around for a hundred years. Incredible program for men. They work with addiction recovery. 
Um, and I volunteer in the soup, uh, I volunteer in the kitchen, serving meals uh, every week. And I just spent time there. I, I was just drawn to this community. And what I found, which was amazing to me, is that folks who had nothing, and literally an environment that most people would never even visit because it's, it's too, you know, scary, uh, was more community I've ever seen in my life. You know, mm -hmm. I've never seen a community like this. We'd go down, I'd take supplies with me and just have conversations. And they'd be like, oh, I don't need that. But my friend over here needs, you know, an extra pair of pants. Yeah. Can you give that to them? Yeah. And I was like, yeah. wow, you take care of one another. And, and that really drew me in. I have friends there to this day that I, would, that I would connect with and just have conversations. You know, nothing about um, religion or, or any context. It's just how are you doing as a human being? What do you need today? And that was amazing. Just have that connection. That started that transformation for me of understanding I truly am blessed. I've never been homeless, but I understood at that moment that sometimes just treating another human being like a human being right. can make all the difference in the world. Two minutes. Wow. And, well, so there, there you were in LA, uh, you and your wife, uh, you, you know, had already been uh, serving with in the advocacy, you know, field and nonprofits. And, and then you met this community and were kind of, you know, welcomed in. They welcomed you like they welcomed each other. And, and you had the opportunity to see a perspective that, you know, most of us don't get the opportunity to see or maybe don't take the opportunity to go and see. And, uh, and that changed everything. It did. Uh, and we, where we lived in L.A., we were constantly put in situations. We, we had people come into our home. We were, it just became part of our life. Um, and friends of ours were like, why are you guys always hanging around with people who are homeless? And I'm like, oh, One I'm like minute. I don't know. I, <laughs> they're, we're just in a situation to help. And yeah. I can't sit here and do nothing. Right. You know? And so for me, it was really about uh, let's just do something. And so, that something wasn't, we, we don't have a lot of money, but we have a, we have a way to connect. And that was important. Well, hey, if you're just tuning into the program today, we're welcoming Joseph Zanovich uh, with Hope, Homeless Outreach Providing Encouragement. And uh, hearing a little bit of the, about the background leading up to that, we come into this next segment, we're going to find out where God took Joseph from there to where he is today. Thank you for tuning into The Beacon. The Beacon is presented by Phoenix Christian, a school celebrating excellence in education since 1949. Learn more at phoenixchristian.org. Hey, all right. Well, welcome back to The Beacon today. We are thrilled to have as our guest, Joseph Zanovich. Uh, Joseph, uh, Executive Director of Homeless Outreach Providing Encouragement. Did I get the title right that time, Joseph, or I did, still need to keep working on it? You got it. You could just call it hope. <laughs> <laughs> and hope. And so uh, really cool as we're kind of learning your story that led to where you're at today, you know, uh, a, a Phoenix native growing up in Phoenix and, uh, and God moves you to L.A., uh, you, uh, you meet and fall in love with a, a dancer there. You have the chance to work in advocacy. And then, you know, the next thing you know, uh, you're, you find yourself on Skid Row, not because you're living there, but because you're visiting there and get to know a community that uh, makes a great, profound uh, impression on you. And, and that brings us kind of to where we're at in the story. At what point did you realize, hey, this is God redirecting uh, you know, my life and my life's purpose and ambition. You know, uh, one of the things I want to share, a very personal aspect of my life, um, which is part of this transition story, is that uh, for me, I was dealing with an addiction. Uh, mm. And um, I, I won't share what that addiction is. Um, however, for me, I was dealing with something in my own personal life um, that was a hindrance really for me just as a human being, just trying to figure out who I was. And what I realized with when I was down in Skid Row is I had so much in common with a lot of them. Um, I got into addiction recovery and that actually changed my life. Mm. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a part of, of my life and allowed me just a, a way that I could see life differently. Um, and I, I just want to say that, you know, so much judgment goes out to those with an addiction, you know, whether it's a visible addiction or invisible addiction. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, so much of our homeless population gets judged by that. But, you know, I want to say that this process in my own life that I've had to go through in understanding this, what it's like, just really gave me a heart because I will never judge someone who's on the street trying to cope. I mean, I always tell someone, try living on the sidewalk for a week and you'll be grabbing something to cope. Um, You know, and so that was a big part of my own transformation um, of really, of really just diving deep. Um, And I took this as my transformation journey and I'm working with folks who were uh, without home. um, And in my own transfer journey, just kind of coincided with this work. Um, Here I am in a place of just complete humbleness, realizing, you know, I need help. And I got it. And LA is the addiction capital of the world for a lot of reasons. And I found so many amazing resources, so many things that just really got me to a place where I could accept, I, I, can, I can really come to a better place. And, and that really was part of my transformation story, which then led me to this, really was drawn to this work. Because my own brokenness, yeah. how, am I, how can I sit here with my own brokenness and yet judge anyone who's, you know, in, in theirs? And so, you know, in LA, you know, we, uh, my wife and I, we had a daughter um, and we started this family and we quickly realized that LA is just a very difficult place. We had no family connections there. I had family in Arizona and she had family right. in Colorado. Okay. And so we decided, you know what, we're still doing this advocacy work with youth protection advocates and dance. We're traveling over, but we need a change of pace. So we decided to say goodbye to LA and we ended up in Longmont, Colorado, where she had family. Uh, I had no intention of getting into homeless work while I was here, um, but I knew it was, a, it was a change of pace to be in your family and have some connections. So, you know, coming to Longmont, um, we, we still had our advocacy group and we're slowly, we decided to phase that out um, for really some, just for peace of mind. We are traveling all the time. Our daughter, by the age of uh, four, had been on over a hundred flights. And... <laughs> Um, our life was just traveling and it was, it was hectic. We're like, okay, we need to slow down. So we ended up in Longmont, Colorado. And as I looked to transition, as I was looking at the transition, there was an opening at Hope Homeless Outreach, which had been found, which had been in place since 2007. I go, and it's something just felt right about this. So I, I went and applied. And of course, I, I got the position there. And from there, I was really drawn into this community. Now, Longmont's 100,000, has a population of 100,000 people. We're next to Boulder, um, and we're about 45 minutes north of Denver, for those who don't know the area. Uh, and Denver has uh, quite a population of those experiencing homelessness. So I'm, I'm stuck in this community um, that I, I've been in now for about a year and a half or so when I started. I'm getting to know it. And what really struck me is that I was able to, on a relational front just meet people where they're at. I would go in this community and just start talking to folks same thing that I did in LA uh, but not as overwhelming um, now I, I can really just connect with the community and then when I you know, started with the organization I uh, was really you know from my background and, and with addiction uh, with my heart for advocacy it just tied together it just made sense and then that's where you know some things cannot be explained Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, at the end of this, it's like something was pushing me all along on this path to this moment and, you know, really happy to be along and be with hope where, uh, you know, we really are making a difference, um, and really trying to create programs that, you know, maybe outside the box or, you know, in some cases, like you mentioned, they're literally right in front of us. We just don't think to use these programs. And so that's what was, you know, really amazing about being in a small place like Longmont. I, I have creativity and a great team that I have around me that we can do some well, really great well, and, things. And along those lines, talk to us about safe lots. Like how did that happen? Because, you know, that, um, that story is, is remarkable. Now, the safe lot idea was born. I heard about it in LA. Uh, LA is uh, in Southern California is the birthplace of this model in Santa Barbara, but So I can't take credit for developing the model for the entire country. However, um, there was nothing like it in the state. And and actually, I don't believe Phoenix has any of any of these models either. A lot of states don't even have them. They so two minutes. I was really I was drawn to this idea because I was tired of turning people away for services. 
I'd get families and, you know, they don't want to sleep apart in the shelter. And I'll just say shelter life is hard. Mm -hmm. We run a shelter, we run it, you know, as humanely as possible. But at the end of the day, you're stuck in a room with a lot of people and there's strict protocols. You don't have a lot of privacy. That's a hard environment. Mm -hmm. So I kept turning people away, people with pets, you know, pets are family. Um, those with PTSD, that's, those are hard environments. So some people would rather sleep on the street. And I realized, hey, but these people are live, sleeping in vehicles. They're going to Walmart or, you know, wherever they could, but right. that's hard. People, please are knocking on the door. And I, I said, there's got to be a way I can provide a safe place for them. And Safe Lot was born. And I had the idea uh, less than a year ago, and I just decided to start working on it. I reached out to some funders. We raised over $100,000. Um, and it's, now it's going. So we have a lot with eight cars, and uh, we have 11 people. We already have a wait list for it. Um, the, the, our safe lot can literally be doubled in size immediately. That's how much demand there is in a city of 100,000 people. So imagine the Phoenix, what the demand would be for something like this. It'd be remarkable. And just the idea that somebody who, for whatever reason, they have a pet, it's a family, they don't want to be separated, PTSD, whatever those things are, they're not a good fit for the shelter. So they're living in cars and places, and they never know in the middle of the night when somebody's going to knock on the window and say, hey, you can't be here, you got to go, you know, or whatever. And this is a safe space where they have a communal opportunity for showers and other services. And it's incredible. Hey, we'll learn more about safe, safe plots. We'll hear more from Joseph. When you come back in this next segment, Joseph has a very important message for you personally. The Beacon is made possible by Phoenix Christian and listeners like you. Hey, welcome again to this episode of The Beacon, where we are uh, pleased to have as our guest Joseph Zanovich out of Longmont, Colorado. Uh, Joseph is with Hope uh, and is dealing with and working with and serving and, and encouraging uh, many who are faced with uh, a situation where they're currently homeless themselves and homelessness is, a, is a, not a respecter of persons or status or city. Uh, you know, regrettably, it's something that, you know, all of us um, could be faced with at some point in our life. And, uh, and Joseph, uh, you know, in this, in this segment, I just, I want to, it's not, a, not so much an invitation as much as it is. I just, I, I, I want to, I want to beg you, if you will, to allow myself and, and, and Jeff and anybody who might be within the sound of your voice in this episode to gain, to benefit from a, a perspective that that God's given you that that we just we don't have and uh, and we know we don't have it, but we don't know what we don't know and and all of us are susceptible in that in that category to having some preconceived ideas that uh, in large part could be pretty erroneous and uh, so set us straight, Joseph. <laughs> well, look, you know when I say the word homelessness, we all have a an idea and a connotation a judgment uh, of what that means to us. We, look, I, I used to look at life through my own filter. I was actually very judgmental of people I'd see laying on the corner. Um, you know, and from my own experience, I, I didn't understand what it was like because I was blessed enough to have, you know, resources in a home and I had a job and, you know, I was okay. And so getting into this work and humbling myself through my own journey of my own brokenness, I, I really had to, you know, part of my transformation is, is realizing, you know, I, I, I've heard it's heard somewhere, you know, about pointing the finger, right? Mm -hmm. And I had to take that to heart uh, to do this work. And so, you know, when, you know, when I see someone who's on the street, I, I don't, I don't care what their political affiliation is. I don't care what's in their hand, what they're smoking, what's in their system. Uh, that doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is, you know, there's a human being in front of me and maybe just saying hello may make a difference. All too often, um, when, if you have the chance to talk to someone who has been without a home, they'll say, you know, I become invisible. Mm. And that breaks my heart because I'll admit myself, I, there'd be times I'd be driving from church, I'd be listening to some Christian music and I'd see someone on the side of the freeway and I'd just be singing along and just ignore them and drive along to where I was going. I mean, and I just had to look at my own hypocrisy as a human being and just like, what am I doing? You know, and look, let's face the reality. Like, I, you know, we can't, we can't help everyone. But at the end of the day, you know, 
if, if we want to do something, we see someone on the corner, you know, we're sitting at that stoplight and someone on the corner holding their sign. You know, sometimes I always remind myself, just wave and say hi, acknowledge them. You know, part of what makes this work so hard is that uh, I, I don't like to see human suffering in front of me, right? And, and that's part of the reason why the homeless population is, is so hard for people in just in general to, to really wrap, wrap their arms around. I mean, literally and figuratively, because in front of us is someone who's suffering. We don't want to see that. It's hard to see, yeah. you know, and that's why it's easy to just turn the opposite way, you know, and so Two folks, minutes. folks ask me like, well, what can I do? And I go, look, you don't always have to give money. And, you know, there's a judgment that people just use this for drugs or alcohol. They're just going to use it. You know, I'm, and I go, that's, that's not the point of what they would do with money. It's the point of the interaction of saying, hello, hey, what do you need? Oh, here's a dollar or, hey, you know what? I got some water in my car, here you go. Whatever it is, that simple 30 second interaction can sometimes just make someone say it because it makes them feel like, you know, they, they matter. And at the end of the day, I know we all want to feel like we matter, you know, and I happen to deal with a population on a daily basis that constantly is told they don't matter. They don't mm -hmm. have a voice. You know, we, we reinforce that every time that we, we ignore them. And so I just, my challenge to anyone that can hear my voice right now is that, look, you may be very blessed in the position where you are right now. Homelessness is not a disease. It can happen to anyone. Folks that are homeless never were, never were you know, growing up thinking, I am going to be homeless. Mm -hmm. No, things happen to them. And, you know, that's, that's really the viewpoint that I have to look at is that this isn't their fault. And we need to stop this blame and just say, there's another human being in front of me. I want to say hello, just like I would say hello to you, to, you know, anyone that I, that I knew as a colleague. Well, it's, it's just such a valid perspective. And, you know, there's not one of us anywhere that's self-made. There's nobody who hasn't been given an opportunity that, that we didn't, wasn't warranted or we didn't, we didn't necessarily deserve, but we were given that opportunity, whether it's family support or church support or just relationships that we have. So it's a good perspective in this next segment we hear from Joseph on how we can make a difference. Phoenix Christian believes strongly in its rich history and bright future. Now equipping students from pre-K through 12th grade, Learn how you can help continue its legacy of Christ-centered education at phoenixchristian.org forward slash support. You're listening to The Beacon, presented by Phoenix Christian. Hey, well, welcome back again to this episode of The Beacon. My name is Steve Woods. I have the privilege of serving uh, as your host today, and I'm grateful to each and every listener, whether you're listening to us on 960 The Patriot, driving around on a Sunday morning, maybe uh, you're on a treadmill, you're out for a walk, and you're, uh, you're listening to us through uh, iHeartRadio or any other uh, way that you received your podcast. Just thank you for tuning in, and uh, you have tuned in to a great episode. We have as our guest, Joseph Zanovich. Joseph, uh, a proud alumni of Phoenix Christian, at least we're proud of Joseph at Phoenix Christian, uh, graduated in 1997 and also in studio, Jeff Blake, who we'll hear from in this segment with a, an update on uh, what, what things are happening in Phoenix Christian uh, during the COVID uh, era, uh, this global pandemic. But, but Joseph, to, to revisit where we were in the end of our last segment uh, and to just kind of to draw into focus the idea that uh, you know, it was something you said really stuck with me and it's true of me and I'm not, I'm not proud of it, but I, I think I can be honest about it. I don't want to look into the face of homelessness. I don't, it, it's uncomfortable. I don't, it, it breaks my heart. Maybe that's why I don't want to look there. I want to, my, uh, you know, my, my natural tendency is just to want to pretend that it just isn't there and it doesn't exist and it's not in my neighborhood or my city or my community and that's just not true. It's dishonest and uh, it doesn't, it's not useful. And frankly, I don't think it's pleasing to uh, my Lord and Savior. And so, you know, with that, with that, you know, personal con confession, I'm not sure I'm alone in that perspective. And, and I'd like you to give uh, people like me some direction on, uh, you know, three simple things that we could do that might that might be short of, you know, going to Skid Row in LA and moving to Longmont and being a, a, a full-time uh, advocate 
on behalf of, of those that are suffering through homelessness, but, but there's a lot of room between looking the other way and, and your life. Give us, give us some space in which we can make a difference in the life of somebody who might be experiencing homelessness. Yeah, thank you, Steve. You know, look, you know, the work I do, I, I realize not everyone can do. Um, you know, and what I talk about, sometimes there's a feeling of guilt or shame uh, that comes about, like, oh, I'm not doing enough, or yeah, gosh, I really do have that judgmental attitude. Look, I, I did too. It's, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a place as, you know, that I had my needs met, and I didn't understand what it was like not to. And so, you know, there are a lot of things we can do in our society, um, so, everything from simple things to more involved. And, you know, simple things is like we talked about, simple engagement. If someone comes across your path, say hello. One of the things that really changed things for me was, was I met one man in L.A. And I, I just, every day that I was there, I, I tried to seek him out and I built a relationship. You know, all too often, part of what causes judgment is the lack of being in someone else's shoes. And, you know, my challenge to myself was, well, let me just get to know someone really well. I don't have to get to know every single person that's homeless. Let me just understand one person's story. And his name was Mark. And, you know, he, he told me about his life in jail and just his like, just crazy stuff that's happened in his life. And I was just like, I can't believe someone has lived through this. Right. And he's still standing. And, and that really just, you know, I, so every week that I'd go down there, I'd just seek him out. And we became friends. We still are to this day. Mm -hmm. You know, so something like that where, you know, if there's someone in your neighborhood, there's someone in your area, you know, if you see them all the time, come by and say hello. Go check on them. You know, that makes a huge difference uh, in someone's life to know that someone actually cares about them. And you never know where that relationship will lead. I mean, the reality is that relationship transformed me probably more than my friend Mark in LA who was, who was homeless because – yeah. I had to get outside of myself, you know, so there's things like that from the relational context. You know, I challenge those that live in neighborhoods and if there's an affordable housing complex coming up, you know, let's rethink this. You know, not everyone has the resources to live in a nice neighborhood and we need more affordable housing because people are getting kicked out of that. So I challenge folks that instead of just saying, I want to hold on to my home's value or that uh -huh. perceivable value, open ourselves up to people all kinds of folks, because no one has ever suffered from being around a more diverse community, right? right? And so, you know, there's things from that angle and city council and, you know, when initiatives come about, let's, let's start looking at the humanity of things instead of the monetary value that could, may affect us. And so much of homelessness judgment comes from, I hate to say it, but greed. Look, mm -hmm. we, I'm guilty of it too. Like we want to hold on to certain things that have perceivable value and anyone who doesn't meet that standard challenges, challenges us on that. And so we can do things even from a higher level. If you have the opportunity in government or you go to city council meetings and look, there, there is just so much, right? So I, you know, I challenge everyone from the small interaction on the street, even in your car, wave hello, um, to, you know, to, to bigger things. If you happen to be in that position, yeah, and if you got a parking lot, you got a building, a church that's sitting empty, and you you feel like, wow, I, I can do something with this. Hey, you can you can reach out to me. I'll give you a ton of ideas what you can do with it. Um, there is so much we can do, and if you are in a blessed position where you're you have your your financial you know your finances are stable, you you have employment, you know, especially in this time. Yeah, you know what, giving back is is the greatest gift you know, we can ever give um, to ourselves, <laughs> let's face it. Well, you, and you know, Joseph, you said something that really resonates and, and, and Jeff, I'll invite you to this part of the conversation too, but this idea that the underlying factor for many of us who, uh, yeah, that affordable housing thing's coming into my neighborhood, how's that going to affect my home value? And, and, you know, we're trying to hang on to some asset or protect some value that, you know, here's, here's a newsflash, is temporal to begin with. Like, so let's say we do protect it for how long and to what degree, you know, none of that's, none of that's going with us into eternity, not, not one bit of it. And so we have this opportunity during this period of time to steward that, which God's given us control or influence over. And yeah, sure. One of those resources is our, is our money and the assets and so forth. But uh, far more valuable than that is, is our time and the relational 
uh, equity that we have that we are going to invest one way or the other. And, and so often it's self-serving. Well, I need to invest in this relationship. Why? Because that's going to help me down the road versus I need to invest in this relationship. Why? Because it's going to help the person that I'm investing in and, and make a difference maybe for the sake of their eternity um, or let's just start with their tomorrow and, and make a difference um, on the way. But uh, you know, Jeff, it's uh we've had a lot of episodes over the course of, of a year that we've been fortunate to have a lot of different guests and uh, you know, the, the way that God is working through the availability of Joseph Zanovich and those with whom he serves is, is one uh, that I won't soon forget. It's, it's really specific. And, you know, I can't, Joseph, I'm not sure if you've read um, anything about Shane Claiborne. I'm sure you probably have, but one of the things that he convicted me on, which I see an embodiment here in the way that you're living your life and serving our community, his encouragement is that we're an answer to our own prayers. Um, prayers designed for a multitude of reasons, but also to shape our heart and your responsiveness to us. And one of the things I also want to encourage you that you're helping me answer the dilemma on is uh, when... I do examine homelessness or a homeless person. I know that mental health concerns are a massive part of, of that dimension. It's frankly overwhelming and it, it's, I don't know where to start. And, and you've helped answer with some specific tangible steps, acknowledge the human being, take some specific steps. Steve, I really appreciate your challenge of examining the, the temporal nature of our lives and, and holding that in contrast to what's eternal. That's helping me answer a dilemma. I'm, you know, both Steve and I live in central Phoenix and it's something that we face every day and that this is helping resolve some of those dilemmas on how best to serve and be available and, and be Christians that, that are salt and light in our community. Well, again, Joseph, uh, I want to thank you on behalf of our program, on behalf of our listeners, um, not only for uh, the time that you've invested with us today, which has been really, really encouraging, convicting, and challenging, um, but also for the example that you um, that you are of you know living out your faith in a way that's making a difference in the lives of people around you. So, um, just thank you again for for being a part of the program today, Joseph. You're welcome. Uh, I'm always happy to have the uncomfortable conversations, um, <laughs> but that's okay. You know, it's, it's the dialogue is what has, helps us grow uh, as human beings. Right. Well, and, and for one, I would say you've made the uncomfortable conversation pretty comfortable and, and hopefully we'll all be able to build on that. But thank you again for being part of the program. Jeff, we yield the, the last section of our time today to hear a little bit from our sponsor. Uh, talk to us about uh, Phoenix Christian in the global pandemic era. You've had another uncomfortable conversation. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Now, Joseph, I just, as a, um, as a educator here at the school, I just want to celebrate and affirm what you're doing. Uh, you're an embodiment of everything that we hope for. Uh, your Facebook post and to learn about what you're doing is an encouragement. You inspired the staff here. I want you to know it was a point of conversation within the organization. We're proud. We celebrate you. We're here to support you. I'm glad to give this platform this morning uh, with you and Steve to celebrate and examine what you're doing and how we can impact uh, others. If someone's interested in expanding something like this in Phoenix, what would you recommend? I'll make myself available. Um, you know, my, my email website, I'm not sure how to get that out to folks, but uh, our website is hopeforlongmont.org. Okay. And you can, you can reach out to me via the website. And I'm always happy to talk about ideas um, for programs, any of that. You guys, so Steve, we'll include that in all of our all links. All of our, yeah. You got it. Well, again, Joseph, thank you. You're an answer to prayer. We appreciate what you're doing very much. I wanted to give the listener um, just a, a glimpse as to our planning, a couple words that we've really been operating by here at the schools. We make decisions. Uh, I feel like every time I turn on the news, I'm hearing the debate about whether or when schools should open on campus, what online instruction looks like. I want to share with the listener some specific steps that we're taking. We're really building it around the word ACE, A-C-E. We want to assess where the students are at. We realize that for many students, some ground was lost in the transition to what really at the end of the day was some crisis education as schools made the transition in, in the spring of 2020. We want to create a plan that meets the student where, where they're at and takes them to the next step. And then we want to engage the student. We want to take the plan and make it work and see the student grow. And we're really gonna dedicate the next, the first four weeks of instruction to taking those next steps with our students. We have given our families um, the opportunity, our intention is to begin on-campus instruction 
uh, in respect and uh, for the difficult place that the governor is in, we're gonna respect his call and begin school on August 20th, but build our day into really two different sections. We're gonna have 50% of our students begin their school day around 7.45 in the morning till around till a little after 11 o'clock. That'll be the first session. We're gonna group families by family and families that carpool and ideally have 50% of our students on campus in the morning, provide an hour break for some sanitization, some cleaning to give our teachers a breather, an opportunity to regather, and then uh, reconvene a, a second group of students around noon and conclude around 3.15 in the afternoon. We really believe that by reducing our student population in the morning by 50%, in the afternoon by 50% is the best way to serve our students. We believe wholeheartedly in protecting the mental health of our students and providing them an opportunity to be back on campus with their teachers and in addition with really small and we're talking an average of 10 in a class class size provides some really specific individualized instructions in our ACE initiative to get these students caught up if a family were needing to have their students here for the full day we've also built in mechanisms for that and of course if a family feels uncomfortable having their students back on campus we've provided an online option we really are here to serve our community, to serve our working families, to protect the mental health of our students, and certainly to protect the physical health. We want the community to know that we are COVID prepared, ready and engaged, and here to serve our community during this difficult time. If someone's interested in learning more, you can visit phoenixchristian.org. Well, thank you for, for that update, Jeff. And, uh, you know, I, I know that every parent, uh, you know, of every kid, regardless of the lane that they're in for education, is dealing with some difficult decisions on, you know, just trying to make the best path for their own family. And, and we welcome them to contact Phoenix Christian, if for no other reason, and to bounce some ideas off or get a, get a second opinion. And so, again, we want to thank Phoenix Christian for being the sponsor of the Beacon Radio Show. We want to thank 960... Uh, the Patriot for airing the program. We certainly want to thank Joseph Zanovich for being on the program again today. Uh, really grateful for uh, each and every listener who tunes in. Uh, you know, we know at least my mom and one of my daughters is listening, so we appreciate them. <laughs> Shout out to them for listening to the program. Uh, we thank you for tuning in. We look forward to the next episode of The Beacon. Make it an awesome day.